Hello, Andrew. Welcome to the show. Hey, Simon. Happy to be here. Hey, it's my uh, absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, I am very excited to hear your story and talk a little bit about what you do these days. It's, um, you know, I don't want to give too much away early in the show here, but um, but as a business owner, I find it really, really exciting Look at looking at uh, your business and how you help people. So, uh, but uh, mate, before we be get ahead of ourselves, um, maybe just for our audience, maybe you could kick off, give us a little bit of your background. Um, I know we're going to talk about a business that uh, that you you founded and eventually sold called Juris Page. So I mean, mm-hmm. uh, maybe you could kick us off, give us some of your background and, and take us up to the, the that point in time. Sure. So kind of best place to start is uh, when I was studying in law school. So uh, I was studying to become a lawyer um, and at the time, I, when I was applying to work at different firms, I noticed that a lot of them had really, really bad websites. And I figured, you know what, there, I, I, I could fix these up. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, my roommate from university, uh, was uh, a freelance designer. And we started talking and we started talking about working together. And we ended up creating an agency focusing on the legal industry. Uh, I didn't really have a background in web design, but my co-founder had that background. I had more of the knowledge in the legal space and ability to speak to that audience. And from there, the, the business kind of took off thanks to our content marketing. I was able to really uh, get the attention of, of the legal space um, through our SEO and content efforts, uh, basically writing content that was a lot of it was coming from like ideas were coming from conversations I was having with other lawyers every day. And so uh, that really helped us scale. Um, we formed a lot of partnerships with other companies uh, in the industry who were able to send business our way, uh, including uh, our eventual acquiring company. And uh, after three years uh, of growing this business, uh, we were acquired by a larger company uh, in the legal space. Um, yeah, and, cool. yeah, that's and that's how it happened. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, and and I'll, I'll, we'll get into that that um, mm-hmm. that sort of deal and how that sort of stuff unfolds. But take me back. I mean, you start doing, you, you know, you're doing a law degree, you're doing all this sort of stuff. Um, did you always have a passion for the law? Like, what led you to to take that path? <laughs> I was studying. Uh, studying business in undergrad and I, uh, it was coming towards, you know, the great recession, uh, as I was graduating at the worst time, uh, <laughs> possible for, for anyone. And I was actually looking into, like, I was, had some side businesses and projects and things like that, that just weren't going anywhere, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and I was trying to figure out, well, what would my next move be? And, uh, some mentors gave me advice. They said, go to law school. It will, help you on your trajectory uh what no matter what you were looking to do whether you're looking to get get into business uh, or or anything like that um and i i was like all right let's try this out and in hindsight i i'm i don't know that i'd give myself the same advice uh for someone with an entrepreneurial itch uh but i i am where i am today because of all that so i can't regret all these decisions too much. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, you know, I think un- having a good understanding of the law is never going to hurt you, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's, it's it's interesting because I think you know y- your sons go, you know, son daughter goes and studies law or medicine or one of these, you know, typical professions. I mean, usually parents are cheering, everyone's happy, yay, they're doing this. <laughs> like, was there a <laughs> point that you kind of realized, you know, okay, I'm, I'm actually not doing that. I'm not going to go and become a lawyer. Uh, yeah, uh, probably during law school when I, I, I was uh, like seeing what practicing lawyers were doing every day, and I did not have the passion and attention span to be able to read contracts all day and look at the minutia of the law that, that uh, a lot of lawyers that I saw were doing. Um, like. In the years since graduating from law school, I've hired many lawyers, uh, like (laughs) hired lawyers for M&A, for our M&As and uh, for getting funding for my latest company. And uh, I've reviewed many legal documents throughout running a company. And 
it, it just it, it's been like my least favorite part or one of my least favorite parts <laughs> of, of doing it um going you know going line by line making sure we're not uh getting taken advantage of in this and something like that and um yeah it just it, it wasn't for me but i uh my stubbornness <laughs> refused to let me quit and so i end up graduating law school and i have a law degree that i don't really use all that much um and i'm licensed to practice law in the state of new york <laughs> uh, that's cool look i totally get that and for those listening i mean um you know andy's a founder of three businesses at least that i know of so you know i think anyone who has that kind of uh drive and interest in starting companies and doing different stuff i mean i, I can i can see why perhaps being a practicing lawyer maybe wasn't a wasn't the right fit <laughs> I- a, a lot of lawyers that I know that are like have that entrepreneurial itch, like they do like startup related law or corporate related law and they're advising startups uh, and, and like doing their M&As and doing their founding documents and stuff like that. And they tell me about all these projects that they were working with and how interesting their clients are. And I'm I'm always thinking, oh, those client projects sound really interesting, but the legal work is not like the sexiest part of, of it. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I'm enjoying more being on the, the founder end of that. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So talk us a little bit more about Juris page. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hand it to you. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, so Juris page is a marketing agency that I started that got acquired. Um, we, yeah, we were able to kind of grow it due to our, really our, our marketing efforts. Um, we, build partnership, like as far as like acquisition channels for new clients, we mainly focused on SEO and content marketing, you know, building a brand for ourselves and partnerships with other companies in our vertical, being able to get them to refer business our way. Um, and that really helped us get into, get other, get into other people's orbits, get into their audiences and get people to find us. Um, and so, yeah, that was really key to our, our, our growth as well as, uh, one big thing for anyone having an agency or really any business is having uh, recurring revenue. Um, and if you're doing services, having them be productized so that your your systems can run. And ideally, you'd be able to remove yourself from the business. So you're building an asset rather than a business that is you being the business. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And 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 how big the clients that you were servicing back then, you know, was were they typical of a certain size or geography or turnover or people are, you know, what what, mm-hmm. did, what did that look like? So they were mostly small firms, like between one to ten people at the firm. Um, partially because as far as the landscape of law firms go. Most practices are solo and, and small firms. Just by the numbers, not every lawyer is at a huge firm, uh, and so there are many practices. And so, uh, yeah, we're working with a lot of, of smaller firms. Uh, we, I also preferred working with them because they signed up quickly and they're they're the decision makers. But yeah. we had a few clients where there were fifty or a hundred person firms, and it would take months and committees. To decide on things and it would it just took forever to get movement there yeah yeah i totally get that it's it's an interesting i mean our our core business um is exit advisory mm-hmm. group you know we we actually advise on m a transactions and stuff like that and you know we always sort of i think everybody in our team loves working in the kind of sme lower middle market sort of space because in smaller companies, you can see things go right through the organization. You know, you're not just a cog in a wheel. You get to kind of see the whole landscape and and dealing with business owners directly, I think, is, is you know, one of the big joys, joys of the job. So. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, okay, so you started um, Juris Page. What year did you start that? Um, what year did I start that? 20, like 2012 or 2013 or so? 2013, okay. I think. And, and um, yeah. And t- talk to me about growth and, you know, obviously what at some point somebody tapped you on the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, a little surprising in that, like, we weren't planning on this from the beginning. It randomly worked out. So we, in hindsight, i uh, proud of myself for like building the business the right way. Um, but I, I don't know that I, 100% knew that at the time I just built the business in the way that 
made the most sense to me. Uh, I hadn't like read any books really saying that this is the way that you need to do it. Um, but for example, like one thing that like we really cared a lot about in building the agency was building a like productized service, meaning that um, even though we're doing web design, which can be very custom, we had fixed packages with fixed deliverables for all of our clients so that we could really build kind of like an assembly line of website projects so that at every stage we knew like, here's what we need for this client. Here is what our typical time investment and cost investment is for each of these aspects. So we can know here's what our margin is, here's how much time it takes. And given that this is our throughput and our entire workflow, we could train people and bring on team members to handle specific aspects of, of the web design process. So we could remove ourselves from it and replace ourselves basically. Uh, and that, you know, being the big goal there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and when you were building these sort of helping with these websites, and all that, so was there a, was it mostly project based or was there a recurring element to the revenue? So everything had a recurring element to it. We, we turned clients away that would say, uh, let me pay you a couple thousand dollars. You'll build the website and then I'll take it and leave. And we would say, um, you know, I appreciate that, but that's not our model. What we're looking for is like, uh, and my pitch was, you know, uh, you're a busy lawyer in a busy law firm. Uh, we are experts at building and managing websites. We're going to build your website. And then after it's done, we will host it, support it, manage it, keep your plugins updated. Uh, if you have a lawyer, new lawyer added to the team or new blog post to add, we'll take care of that. You'll send it to us. We'll add that all to the site for you. So you don't need to spend time doing it because you're billing at $500 an hour or whatever. Um, you don't need to be spending the time doing that. And we're going to manage all of it, host it, support it, and charge you a monthly fee for that. And yeah. The beauty of that is that helps us build our book of business and build our, build our recurring revenue. And so that even if we have, let's say, a bad month uh, where we're not making any new sales, uh, that we have this revenue that's still coming in. So I could take a vacation. My co-founder could take a vacation if we want to. Yeah. Um, and it's not entirely dependent on us making new sales uh, every single day, week and month. Um, yeah, so we can have some some of that. And having that importantly... Uh, that we're where we're not having to constantly hunt for new case, uh, new business to keep us keep the lights on and everything like that. We have this asset which is sellable, and so a anyone coming to buy our company is buying our book of recurring revenue as well. And so that makes us a lot more attractive as as a company to buy rather than uh, a company where maybe we have a brand name, but we're still we still have a team of people that need to keep selling new clients every every single month, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, to, can you tell me a little bit, it's sort of curious that, you know, you've signed people up, there's a, you know, obviously you're delivering some great value up front, they understand the mm -hmm. ongoing nature of it. Clearly, you know, clients like this can fall off the perch as well. So, I mean, I'm just thinking, what do you do to keep those clients engaged? Because I'm, I'm, I'm just randomly, you know, thinking here that there must be lawyers who go, oh, great, the website's built, I don't need to do anymore. And then six months later, they go, well, why am I hiring these guys? Like, I, you know, so do, do you engage those lawyers? Do you talk to them about creating new content? What are you doing to keep this fresh? Like, sure. there must be some approach there, right? So there are, I guess, a few different things that, uh, one, so one thing that maybe, maybe you did weren't addressing that I want to address real quick, which I, I, I thought that was particularly interesting was um, one aspect that we had was uh, sometimes people would sign up with us and say, great, let's do this. And we'd be waiting on them for like assets, like their bios or their headshots. And they're like, oh, yeah. I, I need to get a headshot taken. Give me a couple of weeks. And so uh, we'd be waiting on them and we're like, well, we want to launch the website uh, and we can't do it without your headshot. Uh, and and the, in the earliest days, uh, we our pricing was based on milestones of payment now up front, and then a payment on launch. And I uh, we had a queue of some clients that were six months plus uh, having signed up and not having launched their website, and yep. we we're still not collecting that that launch payment, and we're still not bringing in that recurring revenue from them. So. 
over time we realize, okay, we need to make a change here. We need to charge in milestones and like say like charging up front and then charging at either the site launching or in three months, whichever comes first. And then that's when the recurring component starts. And funny enough for the clients of ours that ended up falling off and forgetting the, or not getting back to us about getting us their, their assets that we needed. As soon as that recurring component hit, they're like, okay, we're really on the clock now. Uh, I'm paying for a site that's not live. Uh, okay. Here's everything that I have, please. Let's get this up and running. Um, yes. and so, so <laughs> but the, the, um, anyway, the other thing that, that you're, you're talking about here is ongoing, like six months down the road, are they like, what do you do to engage with them? And part of our like regular emotions were we had different packages. So we had at a very basic level, uh, hosting and support, and we'll add your content to your new content to the site. Uh, but we also had additional services like, uh, paid search, uh, like Google ads, as well as SEO packages. And so our goal would ultimately be to upsell to those higher end packages because that'd be worth more to us and we can deliver more value to the clients as well. And so uh, when we'd see like clients, uh, we check out their sites in a few months after launch, uh, we'd see if they're, if they're doing anything uh, and if not, you know, pitch them to see if they're looking to do some digital marketing as well and kind of upsell that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes sense. I mean, it's all about adding value, right? You're adding value to your clients. They see more mm -hmm. more business. It's it makes sense to keep going. It's so uh, yeah. I mean, I think that that's quite logical. I just know certainly as having you know started and run numerous business myself, it's hard to stay on top of that stuff. It's hard to stay. You know, you keep trying to create content. You're doing all these sort of things. Uh, I I have to laugh at that whole. Yeah. You know, can't send my headshot photo over because we see similar things in our business, right? <laughs> oh, know? for sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, human nature, I guess, but uh, yeah. Um, so I'm curious. So you um, obviously eventually sold um, Juris Page mm -hmm. through to Uptime Legal. Um, mm -hmm. What? How did that sort of initiate and start? Like, were, were you guys thinking of selling, or did it come out of the blue? What What happened there? Well, it was it was an interesting time because we, my co-founder and I, were about three years in, and. Um, we been approached by like a few different people all at once kind of about getting acquired. And uh, like a, one was in a different industry, but looking to get into the legal space. Um, one was uh, like a smaller company in, in the legal space. And, and so we were now like thinking like, okay, is, is now a good time? Like, is, is this the right opportunity? And then, um, uptime kind of came along and we had mutual clients. They, their company does uh, manage IT services for law firms and you know we do digital marketing for law firms. And so we had some mutual clients that we were doing uh, web design for and they were doing uh, their I, managing their IT their IT stack basically. And we, you know, we were we were friendly. Um, we were uh, doing some uh, collaborations and co-marketing together and they were looking to get into the digital marketing space and trying to looking to make an acquisition of a digital marketing company thinking, you know, uh, with our powers combined, uh, we can help you, your, your agency scale faster. We're a much larger company. We also know the vertical. So we know your clients and your audience, and we can apply our knowledge that we've, that's taken us to be this, uh, successful company to bring you guys to that next level and also introduce you to our book of business and our clients. And also conversely, uh, we can get in front of your existing clients. And so uh, the synergies and the opportunities there to for them to expand in the legal, in legal industry was was exactly what they were looking for. Yeah, there's this obvious mm -hmm. strategic levers there. It makes there's, mm -hmm. there's some, yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah. But, and what does that sort of process look like? I mean, you, you're traveling along, you've had a bit of interest. Um, it's nothing like somebody reaching out and tapping on the shoulder to make you think about selling, right? It's, um, <laughs> so, so you've had a little bit of that, and maybe that's framing your thinking. But, but so the the one thing I guess I said one thing I want to say about this is um, over the years, um, I we've over the years and before and since I've been approached by a lot of interested people in acquiring businesses that I'm working on. And a lot of them are, are, are duds or are nothing. And so I've been like a healthy amount of skepticism. Um, like 
sometimes people reach out uh uh with with like basically like they're saying like all right i'm looking for someone at an arr of this and it's like all right well that's way out of where we are i don't know that we're getting there anytime soon uh but i appreciate that you think that we're there uh but uh we are not and so no thanks um we'll we'll get back to you later or it's someone looking for just a really really good deal that's just not going to yeah. happen for us um and so uh anytime anyone ever reaches out about acquiring uh i've just had like a healthy amount of skepticism but you know having no, having this prior relationship having known this company uh i knew that they were at the at the very least somewhat serious and so um like that conversation was uh a bit less less tense than than some of the other ones or a bit less of me shrugging it off right away like oh okay yeah. um but yeah like when they had reached out they're like are you interested in being acquired and i said uh i maybe i don't know <laughs> yeah 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 no probably not but let's let, what are you thinking because uh yeah because it hasn't been on our radar so much but it, it you know if it were if it works out then great yeah Look, I think that's such an, an important point, um, you know, about people reaching out. It's, you know, I, I've had numerous clients who've come to us because they've been tapped on the shoulder, approached, you know, numerous times. Um, some of them, they've gone down into deep d due diligence. Like I had one guy mm. who went through an 18-month courting period just for this potential acquirer to say, I oh, know no, we've had a shift in corporate objectives, we're not moving ahead. And oh my gosh! Yeah, so the amount of time, money, effort, energy, distraction—you know, opportunity cost from focusing on other things—was enormous. And um, and eventually they've said, "Well, look, we actually want to sell, so we, we're going to run a professional process and we want to engage someone." Um, have you ever gone down a DD process like that and had it kind of turn on you? Or um, th thankfully not. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, the due diligence process with uptime took a few months and I, I was like all right well so what what do we need to do and it was like you know all right we need the full financial picture and all the documents that you have basically we just need to do a serious like forensic analysis we need to know about all of your clients all of your contracts uh everything basically because we want to acquire this this entire book of, of business of yours and we want to make sure that it's it's worth something that it's worth that it's uh you know worth what we want what we're you know going to pay for it and so uh and that there are no hidden liabilities or anything like that that could get get in the way or, or come bite us in the future um yeah. so yeah it it was it, it was like the due diligence was a, was a big process and i i i like i think moving forward like uh, I, I've been like super skeptical about anyone reaching out acquiring because I know what the due diligence processes look like. And if, if I'm going to get a, uh, you know, like a term sheet or a letter or anything like that, or a letter of intent or anything like that, um, to go down the due diligence process, I'm not going to want to go through with it if it's speculative or if potentially it just seems like they're someone is a tire kicker or someone looking for a good yeah. deal or, uh, or potentially someone looking to get intel. Um, yeah, so yeah. I tend to try to be guarded because of that. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the, the comment there about intel is an important one because I know um, there may be people listening at the moment that are perhaps mm -hmm. considering a deal. Was there, you know, you just gave a big list of things that they asked for. <laughs> you know, yeah. w was there stuff there that was super confidential that you know we use this term black box and stuff like that but was there stuff that you kind of had had to say i'm not asking for what that stuff was but were there any elements to your business where you said listen that's too sensitive i can't give you that up front you we need to wait till we're either signing a contract or it's later in the process or something like that so i i will say that or like basically before we went into the the deep end with due diligence and um all of that, we did kind of have an agreement to the terms and like the terms and that this is what the deal would be provided we get provided we get through due diligence um, without any any potential issues. And so um, by the time we got to due diligence th with this particular acquirer, I, I was comfortable with where we were and comfortable kind of sharing what we ended up sharing with them to to get this all done. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. No, that's a great, great to know because it's, I, I, I've seen both ends of the spectrum, you know, somewhere there's, it's basically a competitor buying them and it's, you know, mm-hmm. there's super sensitive stuff and, you know, how do we protect that and confidentiality and all the rest. So, I mean, if that's, if it's yeah. not an issue going in, then that's brilliant. It makes, probably makes it go a lot quicker and smoother. <laughs> and I, I, I think about that because like for the future, is there, is, is someone who's going to acquire my, my company post, my current company post Daga, could it be a competitor? It, very well could be. And what's that going to look like if we get to due diligence? I'm probably going to be a bit nervous in that I'm going to be telling them, you know, here is what we're making right now. Here are our margins. Here is our book. Of, here are our clients. And here's our technology that you're going to want to audit before going through with this. And how, am I going to be giving giving away a huge competitive secret, trade secret, competitive advantage that somehow if this falls through, I'm going to be at a big disadvantage. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, I'm, it's, I'm it's curious. a big issue. Yeah. <laughs> as, someone who's in, as someone who's in this space, now, like, you know, you're yeah. asking me questions. Now I'm asking you for advice. What, what does one do to protect themselves <laughs> in that situation? <laughs> yeah, we're looking at it. It is, a, it is a, a really important issue. And it's whether it's code or client lists and whatnot. I mean, I've certainly, what we've seen in transactions is we've had um, request lists handed over by buyers and their advisors. Um, Mm -hmm. we've itemized, usually a majority of things are okay to hand over, but where they've been super sensitive, we put them into a theoretical black box where we've said, we understand your need to um, review client lists and names, but given Mm -hmm. that we are competing literally against each other in some of these markets, we are not going to give those lists of names. We will, and we do stuff like, We'd talk to them about percentage of revenue of clients to show that there wasn't an over-concentration. We'd split things by geographic markets to give them a sense that mm. there's not an overexposure. We'd you know, do all these sort of different things to help them understand and mitigate risk without having to give away the golden nugget. Um, mm. and, and even with when it came to code, for example, um, we've had a couple of scenarios where we've had buyers where we've both said, look, we understand your need to check the code, but we also understand our need to protect our code from you if you don't go ahead. (laughs) Um, Let's both agree on an independent company or party who's an expert in doing this kind of review Mm. and let's have them in a a very unique scenario review parts of this code and give you a report on various quality aspects or factors that you need to understand. Interesting, yeah. Um, and so we've found that that has actually worked really well. And, and you know, of course, then the question from some of our clients was, well, how about this guy and his confidentiality? And other than signing an agreement, we've actually had some people who had to go into a certain room at a certain time at a certain computer and they were given <laughs> access. That was it. You're allowed to sit here and you're allowed to review things for this period of time. Um, and some people are extremely paranoid about it. And, sure. you know, that's okay. It's their business. It's their baby. But... Um, yeah, I think I think it's just about walking through scenarios to find something that works for both parties. You right. know, it's just giving give them comfort, right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so interesting, interesting times. Um, so, tell me, when you were going through this, did you have a bit of a deal team around you? Did you have advisors? What did that kind of look like? So, uh, I we did have some mentors. Um, we uh, were. Working with like we working through a university uh, startup accelerator program, and they had um, advisors on staff who gave us like gave us good feedback when we reached out to them and said, "Hey, this company is looking to acquire us. We haven't been through this before. What should we do? What should what mistakes should we avoid? Like, what is there that to avoid that we don't? What what is there that we don't know? <laughs> um, okay. So we can you know not make a stupid costly mistake, and so." Um, they were great. There we, were some mentors who had, you know, been through this before. Did M and A deals of a lot larger sizes, and so we were we were kind of small potatoes, nothing. But they they were really able to kind of help help ease some of our concerns. Like say like, all right, well, this thing that they're asking for is normal. This is not, and so on, and kind of that like that. Uh, but also yeah. very important, we hired a lawyer who does this every day. Uh, I I, <laughs> I you know, no, no pride on my part being a lawyer and everything, but I don't do M and A deals every day. Uh, that was my this is my first M and A deal ever, and I didn't want to make any mistakes. Uh, 
by just by, by in not hiring a lawyer who does this all the time. And so we hired an MA lawyer who reviewed all the agreements and you know let us know this is this this is what looks right. Here's what the process is going to be like, and really held our hands through it, which I'm very grateful for. One of the things I really love what you just said there was that having an, uh, a lawyer who does this stuff every day, <laughs> and 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 how important that is because I, you know having done a lot of transactions, I often get introduced to the lawyer who hey this guy does our employment contracts and our conveyancing, oh, and you're gosh. like oh my goodness, <laughs> yeah, and and like I I know there are like you know the small town lawyers who do a little bit of everything, and uh, I don't know I. If if I'm buying a house, I want to use a lawyer who specializes in that. But that's what they know. Um, you know, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. I, I, I would feel much more confident working with someone who does this all the time. And yeah, in in my experience, like uh, I I know plenty of people who have who have like used lawyers who like they're like, oh yeah, I think I could do this. And you know, speaking as as a lawyer who knows a lot of lawyers and legal things, um, I I know that screw ups and mistakes can happen when you have someone going outside of their area of expertise. Um, just thinking, yeah, I, I could pick this up, and you know, the thing is, if it's the first transaction for anyone in this space, it's going to be a learning experience. It's going to be a learning experience for you with your company getting acquired or you acquiring a company. Um, there's going to be a lot of knowledge that you're going to gain and it's going to be a great experience to get through it. But um, for me, at least uh, with, you know, money on the line here, I, I don't, I would rather not be paying for someone's experience to get in this. I'd rather be leveraging someone's knowledge that they have from years and years of doing this to make sure that we're not going to get uh, in, in a bad way at the end of this and be unhappy with how it turns out. Great advice, absolutely great advice. Yeah, I mean that's what you're paying for, right? Is that the 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 experience? You're not paying for somebody to learn about how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know you want the guidance to to avoid the potholes, and um, yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Andy, I'm, I'm loving your story and I'm so cognizant of your time. I appreciate how generous you've been here. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing today. Talk to us about um, Postago. Is it, is yeah. that, have I pronounced that correctly? Yeah, Postago. So kind of it came about kind of through the experience that we had running uh, our, our agency, which was that um, with SEO in particular, with trying to rank better in search engines, um, it's a very competitive space. And we've seen that, you know, in our analysis, in our research, we've seen that one of the most impactful things on determining whether you rank better in search is the quantity and quality of links from other sites to your site. Um, but the method that people use traditionally to reach out to other sites to get them to link to them uh, is very time and labor intensive. Basically, it, it's the, like, let's say like I write a blog post, I want other other websites to link to it. So I'm going to f do some research, find other sites, find the right contact people, reach out to them, ask them to link to my content saying like something like, uh, hey, I, I saw that your article is really great on this topic. Um, and you mentioned this thing uh, that our article really covers well. I wanted to see if you'd be interested in linking to our article and providing a new great additional resource for your audience. Um, and that's one of several different, you know, link building outreach strategies, but it can and has been very time and labor intensive and is not uh, super easy or scalable for an agency or a freelancer or an in-house marketing team. So uh, after we sold our company, we were interested in kind of solving this problem and we built Postago, which uh, helps with, uh, is an all-in-one platform for helping with email outreach, specifically for finding relevant sites, uh, finding the right contact people at these websites and reaching out to them. And yeah. what started out as kind of like specifically focusing on outreach for link building and SEO has really morphed into outreach for everything from like digital PR. So for example, uh, using it to connect with podcasters, to pitch yourself as a guest on other podcasts, to 
pitching bloggers to cover your latest product or app to also doing cold outreach for sales to find companies uh, in your uh, companies that might be good fits for buying and using your product or service. Um, yeah. yeah. That's fascinating. It's it's really. I mean, I, I I know nothing. I mean, I know just just enough about marketing <laughs> to be dangerous. And um, you know, I've I've heard of. Um, well, I want to ask a bit more about the platform, and how that works. But just mm-hmm. coming back to the backlinks for a moment. Yeah. Um, I once heard, and and there's probably a few other you know marketing dummies like me out there who might be nodding at this. But I heard somewhere that people out there can have the wrong kind of backlinks and that Google can punish them or something like that. Is, is that right? Have I got yes. That? <laughs> um, if, you, if you want to destroy your website, uh, go buy a bunch of backlinks on Fiverr or, or a site like that. Um, there, there are plenty of websites out there that Google recognizes as bad, as spammy. Um, and uh, if a lot of them link to you, in particular websites that are irrelevant to yours, where their content is irrelevant, where they're just linking out to everybody, and it's clear that like it, it's clear there's a a scheme going on where someone's like, pay me, uh, a- anyone can pay me fifty dollars, hundred dollars, and I will link to you. Um, and links coming from sites like those are not going to help you, and may in in fact hurt you if Google sees that you're doing this at, at uh, at any scale like that, um, it, it can get you penalized and ultimately hurt your rankings yeah. in search. Um, yeah, so like the best way to do it, it like do your outreach to get links um, is a, traditionally a very manual process of reaching out and connecting with other sites and building those relationships. And while that can be historically has been very time intensive to do the research, find the right sites, and connect with them. Uh, our platform uh, cuts the time in half or significantly down uh, by yeah. basically automating uh, the research, contact finding, and building personalized pitch emails. Yeah, wow. Okay. So so uh, tell me a bit about how the platform works. Yeah. I, I mean, as a business owner, I'm intrigued in this myself. But let's say um, I sell widgets. I mean, you know, um, does, does somebody go in there and what do they do? Put yeah. keywords in or something? And so, so our platform is really built for anyone with any experience level of doing outreach. Um, uh, so, like, if you are if you are not a link building outreach professional, this isn't something that you do every day. Like, we have a lot of users that are like solo founders. Or where they're they are the marketing department, you know, uh, at a yep. company, and so basically you you log in, you have, and you go to a campaign selection screen, and there are a bunch of options and choices. Uh, like, all right, do you want to get on podcasts, or do you want to pitch your product to get reviewed on blogs, or do you want to uh, do one of these uh, link outreach uh, techniques? And so, let's say you make widgets, and you want um, a widget adjacent blog to cover you uh, and write about your widgets. Um, you choose that campaign type. Uh, you then uh, can, for one, like one example of how like I might do outreach would be, I find where competitors' products are getting written up in blogs or other companies in our industry are getting written up and then search for them using our, our our own search engine that we have built in our platform. We then find those blogs and we and now you're thinking, okay, great. Hey, if this blog has covered this product, I'm assuming their audience is interested in a product like mine. So then I'm going to want to reach out to those websites and those uh, bloggers and pitch them to cover my product. And yeah, we wow. do all of that. So we do everything from like finding the relevant websites to finding their contact information, their email addresses, and then building, uh, you know, email sequences that are personalized for each of these sites. Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, that's, it, I mean, as I said, I've done just enough marketing to be dangerous, but um, <laughs> I know how much, how labor intensive it is. And, you know, we, we often talk about even going and finding buyers for businesses and having to map a market and understand who's out there and how does that work? I mean, I think that's... Um, that's a really, really interesting um, service you guys provide. It's um, and, and typically, does it um, you know, does it 
come up with lists of is it hundreds of companies is it is it small and targeted is it are you guys doing the actual email yourselves is it <laughs> so so a lot of it is, so a lot of it is um automated the most tedious aspects of it are automated and streamlined so for example and it can be as targeted or as broad as you want so let's say for example i have a brand new crm that i make and i want to you know i want to get written up in blogs that have covered other CRMs like Salesforce or HubSpot CRM or something like that, um, the platform our platform can find blog articles doing write ups or reviews of these products um, or other products in the niche and uh, find their contact information, reach and then reach out and pitch them. Now, if I have a product in a small space in a, uh, with not so many competitors, I'm probably not going to find as many uh, bloggers or journalists to reach out to. Uh, CRMs though is a larger space and there are plenty of blogs who have written articles about CRM. So there's probably gonna be a lot, hundreds at least to choose from. But uh, if I'm in a very, uh, if I'm in a smaller market that doesn't have as much press coverage, um, it's gonna be a much smaller uh, audience, but it's all like, it's all very, very targeted so that we're finding, uh, we're finding bloggers and journalists that are covering ex like exactly our product. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And and um, Postaga, does it does it focus more on companies that are selling products or does it not matter? Is it services as well? Is it a mix? Yeah. Yeah, is there a sweet spot? So so uh, there are kind of are a few different use cases that we see in audiences. So there are some, some of our audience are, uh, they are people who like SaaS businesses who have products uh, there are e-commerce businesses that that have products as well, but also you know agent marketing agencies, service businesses, uh, agencies that like use Postaga for their clients to do outreach for their clients, but also really anyone with an online presence. Like let's say you have a blog and you have a local business, and so you're not like you don't have an app that can get reviewed or written up in other blogs. Uh, but you do have a blog with great content that you want to build links to. Um, it's still it's uh, a good use for for that. And so, um, yeah, I'd say like the main uses that that we see that people are using Postaga for are what uh, one uh, I have a blog and I want to build traffic to my site. Um, so let me find other websites that want to link to and cover my uh, and link to my topics and like my articles and help me rank better. Um, the second is uh, businesses that want to get, you know, press coverage, get featured in write-ups and blogs or be guests on podcasts and reach new audiences. And the third are uh, people in sales roles who are looking to connect with partners or customers and using our, you know, search engine and our uh, email sequences to reach out to uh, potential customers. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. And, and and is this service only provided in the states, or is it global? Is it are there any restrictions to it? There are not, and we are you know we are mindful of email sending laws in different jurisdictions and things like that. Um, but yeah, we have users all over the world. Um, you know, yeah, you know, um, Australia, United States, uh, everywhere. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, great. Um, Andy, I'm going to put you on the spot in a moment, at, uh, and, okay. and I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, if maybe there's one tip, perhaps that you might share with other fellow entrepreneurs who are who are on their journey. You know, you've you've talked a lot about building value, and mm. you've been through transactions, you've rebuilt other companies. So um, there's probably 20 tips you could give, but I don't know if there's one that you'd like to pick on. But but before I put you on the spot and mm. ask you for that. Um, are you happy if people are listening to this for them to reach out and connect with you? Or yeah, I'm very easy to find on the internet. Um, so my company's website is postaga.com, P-O-S-T-A-G-A. -A. Uh, we also have a Facebook group. Um, yesterday, the Facebook group was down because Facebook was down yesterday, um, which was fun. <laughs> um, the Facebook group is called uh, Grow Together SEO, and it's all dedicated towards uh, SEO, link building, and digital marketing, um, and you know, leveling up our our marketing game. Um, I'm also easily to easy easy to find on Twitter at Andy Cabasso, on LinkedIn at Andrew Cabasso, um, and I also have a website, uh, AndyCabasso 
dot com. Um, cool. So yeah, you know, I will grab those links. We're gonna <laughs> put those in the show notes for you. Uh, make it a lot easier. Um, as we always say on this show, people, if you do reach out to Andy on uh, on LinkedIn and things like that, please put a little note there. Let him know maybe that you heard him on the podcast, so he has some context. Uh, and we're not doing these random, weird, strange outreaches. <laughs> um, <laughs> Andy, I, I'm really appreciative of you coming on and sharing your story. I think it's fascinating this this whole journey of going through uh, a transaction. I think this is, it's just such an area that people don't talk mm. much about and so there's this cloud or shroud of secrecy around it and I think it's confusing for a lot of business owners sure. so um, you know really appreciate you um, you sharing some insights with us um, yeah. before I let you go uh, you know is is there perhaps one or more than one tip maybe got, that um, that you'd like to share I got a lot of tips um, so I mean the the first one being um, b- like you want to build a business with recurring revenue um, that is hugely, hugely important um, because if you have recurring revenue, you have an asset, um, a business that can be sold that exists outside of you and your efforts. Um, And also uh, speaking kind of to that is um, it's great if you can build a business that, you know, is not you where if you disappear, the business can't run. So having like SOPs and um, standard operating procedures and documentation and processes so that you have team members that are, are working and running the business and not reliant completely on you to be there um, makes your business an asset as well. Otherwise, when yeah. someone's looking to buy your business, you're like thinking, all right, they're really buying me and my intellectual property here. And um, you you know may be more tied to it than, than them buying the assets of the business itself. So, um, yeah, that, that's definitely an important consideration there. Um, and last thing is like surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and get advice from people who are more successful and experienced, um, and have experience in areas that you don't, and you don't have knowledge in us. Having an M and A lawyer was really helpful. Us having mentors who know about M and A was so much more helpful than us going alone and trying to f- possibly figure it out ourselves. And you know, today with Postaga, we got into this uh, startup accelerator called Tiny Seed, which has been uh, like amazing for our startups' growth. Um, our like trajectory has completely changed mainly because the program has these mentors that are have found uh, like all had their own successful businesses all have expertise in different areas from uh from finances to valuations to uh marketing to operations and sales and ux and everything uh that like i i'm constantly learning new things i'm i'm learning things that i didn't know I didn't know. And it's just (laughs) helping my business grow much quicker and and faster. And so surrounding myself with people and getting advice from people who have been through and been through all of it and know a lot more uh, are helping me grow my business much faster. And so I really can't stress the importance of that enough. Uh, That's brilliant advice. Brilliant advice. Andy, super grateful. Really appreciate you sharing your story and those tips. I think it's it's I don't doesn't don't think it matters what business you're in, what industry you're in, what country you're in. They're great. It's great advice, and I'm sure people will take a lot of that on board. So yeah. thanks again for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, if anyone is you know starting on their journey or along the way, uh, and if there's any advice, uh, other advice I can provide, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help. Ah, uh, you're a good man. Hey. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, Simon. <laughs>